Shelmay, first excited to welcome the program. Uh, my co-host, Paul Hollis, author of the Hollow Man series, owner of Hollow Man Publishing, and also American Made VA. And we have a celebrity guest. I know he will not say this. He's, he wants me to call him Jason, not Congressman Jason, uh, especially because he was a congressman in, in my state of Pennsylvania. But go ahead and introduce our guest, Paul. Great. I'm, I'm very excited and pleased to uh, to welcome uh, Jason Altamar. He, he is um, not only a CEO, but he's also a, a well-informed author, an adjunct professor, and as uh, Neil said, he is a, actually a former uh, congressman. So welcome, Jason. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Neil. Glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation. All right. So life after Congress. That's what I'm going to just go right off. It's almost mm -hmm. like life after football. And especially you had a decent run when it's over. It's, it's really difficult, right? It's almost, I wonder if they ever did any research of former congressmen, senators, presidents, what they do life after to really figure out things. There are things to do, but especially in where this is your full-time gig. And then it changes completely after you were civilian life to that life, then back to civilian life again. I've been out of office now for over 11 years, which is hard for me to believe. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've transitioned and, and I look back on that experience with fondness and pride. And I'm glad I got to make a difference and, and have, you know, an experience that I think most people would uh, would say is, is a very positive experience. And, and, you know, what I've found in the last several years is the perception of Congress has changed to such a negative extent. Uh, when I first left office, you know, if you're at a cocktail party or something and it comes up, you know, I wouldn't bring it up, but if it comes up, if you're a former congressman, people would be impressed. Oh, wow, that's good. But now there's a noticeable difference. And if you reference that you were affiliated with Congress or you were in national politics in some way, more often than not, people will kind of back off. They don't either don't want to have the conversation or they have a negative impression. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that's unfortunate. And I know we're going to get into the polarization stuff. But what, when I left office, I was 44 years old. OK. And, uh, you know, so I, I wanted I guess my goal in thinking about what I was going to do next is I didn't want the pinnacle of my professional career or my life to have happened when I was in my 40s. I wanted to keep going and keep trying to make a difference and just refocus and do different things. And I, I feel like I've been able to do that. I'm, I'm comfortable with life and the way it's played out and, and how things have uh, moved forward. And, and uh, again, I'm grateful to have had the experience, but there are other things to do for sure. Okay. So what were those other things? One, did you have plans? Were you always planning when you did leave office that you had a life after plan, especially younger, because you're a younger congressman than some, right? And it, they could have been there forever for even longer as some of them are in, in their seventies and mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, interestingly, even before Congress, you know, I was a congressional staffer and I had been a government relations executive. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in Washington on that. And I always was I had worked for a trade association, a national trade association. And I always had that as a goal. I always wanted to lead a national association for a cause that I believed in and felt like I could make a difference. And I did always think when I left office, that would be a direction that I would want to go. And I didn't do it immediately after I left office, but it's what I'm doing now and have been doing for the past four years. And uh, I really enjoy it. I, I still keep my finger in the pie with regard to DC and Capitol Hill and you get to talk to members and, and uh, deal with issues that are important to America. But uh, I also, you know, get to live in Florida and enjoy life, I think, a little bit more than I would otherwise have if I was still in D.C. Yeah, for sure. And then and especially where did you grow up in Pennsylvania? Just real quick, and I'm going to jump back to the next question. Grew up in western Pennsylvania, uh, a little town called Lower Burrow, which is in Westmoreland County. Uh, Burrow High School was the high school. Okay. All right. So I... I was born and like in, in near in shady side grew up in uh, Edgewood. Then now I'm in O'Hara township, but I was in, in North, the North Hills, Pine Richland area for like 20, 25 years I was in Texas for two years too. Let's kind of, so uh, like trying to understand this, why didn't you do that first? The whole, your kind of what your plan was when you first left office. My plan. Oh, when I first left office, I, uh, 
because I lost the primary, there was a lot of time in between. It was in April. So it was a lot of time in between the end of my term. So I had time to kind of sit back and think about what I wanted to do. And that also gives folks that are looking for, for folks to, to approach. And, and one of the groups that did that was uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida. I had a healthcare background, had been an executive for a large hospital for UPMC, which you certainly wow. know in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I have always been fond of Florida. My wife's from Florida. I went to Florida State and uh, have spent a lot of time. So I was really intrigued by that. It was a senior vice president position for a $20 billion company. Wow. So I, I felt very good about the opportunity and uh, have been it's outside of Jacksonville. We live in Ponte Vedra Beach, and I've been here for 11 years. Uh, I wrote the book, which I think you want to talk about, in 2017. So I left that role and traveled the country on a book tour, which is really one of the greatest experiences of my life because you go out and you talk about an issue that matters and that people care about, and you see the passion and get to visit other parts of the country. And uh, I, I really enjoyed the book tour. And then afterwards, I got a you know COVID uh, came along and I, I got a doctorate at University of Florida in business administration because I really got into academic research and writing my book. I was intrigued by the process of how research is, is done. And then uh, during the presidential transition in 2020, the association that I now lead went through a leadership transition and uh, I took this role and have been there ever since. All right. So let's talk about the book, then the association and polarization. That's perfect uh, segues. First, first, the book. Why the book and what did you want your readers to find out about you? The book is called Dead Center and it's, you know, it came out in 2017. So it's been a while, but uh, I was writing about political polarization and the danger that it represented to the country. And I did three things. I talked about the causes of polarization, what leads to it. And then I had academic research in there about how partisans think, what makes them tick. Uh, if you present them with information that conclusively proves their point of view is wrong, will they accept it? How do they react in groups? How does extremism you know, and, and the movement to the left and the right work and why does it happen? And then I, I weaved in examples from my own career in Congress from how polarization impacts public policy and what's it like to be a centrist in a polarized Congress. Mm -hmm. And the book did really well. Again, it was called Dead Center. And uh, I spent eight months traveling around talking about it and did all the shows and uh, it, it it sold well. And and still, uh, there, I hear that universities use it around the country as a textbook when uh, political science classes look at, at uh, polarization. And I still speak about it all the time. We're doing a podcast on it right now. But it's unfortunately gotten worse. Uh, I, I regret to say that I was right about, uh, you know, kind of forecasting where the country was headed and it's it's not gotten better. And unfortunately, that's tainted the perception people have of all of our institutions, of the media, of politics, of higher education. And I think that's really unfortunate for the country. It definitely is. And so I, as I've grown to get older, I I've been on both sides. When I was an educator, as a young age in my 20s, I was a Democrat. Then I became a Republican when I started having a family. And now I consider myself center. I think it's, and I'm not, as a former professional wrestler coming back into professional wrestling, I think it's kind of a work in a way that a lot of times the media makes it that you guys hate each other more than you really do. And you have relationships with a lot of people and that the it's the political infringe of people on both sides that are, the the definitely media wants to make it look worse and definitely there are certain people that believe everything and that causes the not know that you know what you don't hate people who are republicans you don't hate people that are just uh are like angered at anyone in your party that was far left of what they're doing you don't agree with their policies some of them like you don't agree with some of the rights policies but it's not like this hatred that is going on in our nation. It's very hard for me to even have a Republican on my show because I will have people that literally will pull their stuff. Now, if I have a Democrat on my show, none of my Republican clients, none of my Republican friends, none of them would get mad at me. They could care less. I, I've, I interviewed Bill Ayers, for God's sakes, and they didn't have a problem with me at all. 
But if it's the other way around, if I bring somebody in that might be a little bit of a conspiracist, might be willing in these things, how dare you put him on the airwaves? Well, I can go put Bill Wares on the airwaves. I can go bring Jason Allmeyer on the airwaves. I can bring on somebody who believes in many different things that the right does, and they're not crucifying me. So there's the difference in the polarization. But yet, both sides don't like each other far, far right and left. And how can we get people more into the center so we can become a more united nation? Well, I think as a nation, the majority of America is more towards the center, not the people in politics, but just normal folks. They wake up every day. They think, what's my work schedule today? What am I going to do on the weekend? Who's my sports team play tonight? They are not thinking about Washington and what's my congressman doing, you know, and the the problem is the people that do that wake up every day thinking about politics. Generally, it has been my observation and the research shows this. They have an unhealthy obsession with it. They are far more extreme than most Americans. And when you look at, for example, the Pew Research Center, they do a every three years a typography study of the country. They found that about one third of Americans identify on the political extremes, the far left or the far right, equally distributed between the left and right. And that number has grown and continues to grow every time they do it. But still, two thirds of the country are not. And the problem is the people who are on the extreme, they contribute to candidates and work on campaigns. They give money to candidates. And most importantly, they vote in primaries at double the rate of everybody else. Oh, wow. So they have outsized influence. You live in Pennsylvania. I live in Florida. They're both closed primary states. So the people who are advantaged by that are the candidates that can tailor their message and speak to the extremes. And unfortunately, then you get to the general election and the normal folks show up. Everyone else you know, comes to, out for the general election. They say, why are these my choices? I have somebody on the far left and the far right. Why, why, why can't we have somebody in the middle? I don't like either of these choices. And uh, unfortunately, to a degree, that's playing out at the national level, too. Oh, it totally is. And but it's good. But see, here's the also problem we're dealing with. It's good for business. When both sides hate each other, there's more opportunity, more rate, better ratings. Okay. We all miss when the Steelers lose, they get better ratings for the Steelers, meaning uh, all the channels and everything when the Steelers lose them when they win. Mm -hmm. So it's always about that. Uh, that's why most of the news is bad news, right? That's on the local TV. It's never really heartfelt stories. So the more that they were polarized, the more money the big corporations make that are funding the uh the big channels the more the uh, people get stressed which can lead to a lot more people on blood pressure medications or different things and they and the fear the fear keeps people in, con in a control factor so i think when you look at polarization of the country i think that they'll never want this to end because it's bad business am, am i thinking crazy in this or, or not <laughs> Yeah, here's something that's interesting along those lines that like it, I get asked if I was to write sort of a, a second book or or an addition to my book and you know, what's changed in the past five to seven years. One of the things that is noticeably changed is, you know, cable news has always been a driver of polarization because right. it used to be in 1980, let's say you had three choices. You had Walter Cronkite, David Brinkley, or John Chancellor for the evening news. That was it, a half hour at night. And if you wanted to watch Wheel of Fortune, you had to sit through the evening news to get there. And people were more civically minded and engaged because they were forced to watch the news, even if they didn't want to, because they wanted to get to. Well, now you can watch the Kardashians, you can watch sports, you can watch right. Home and Garden Network, you can watch Netflix, whatever it might be. So the people who care about politics, as I was saying before, they gravitate to the cable news. They generally cater to the extremes. But but he, here's where I'm going with this. The people who are elected to public office now are much more inclined because of social media that we were talking about earlier, because of cable news, they want to get on TV, right? They, they, yeah. they, they, they want to go viral. They, and you see on both sides that people who would have been backbenchers in Congress for years, maybe for their entire career are now celebrities. 
because they know how to use social media because they say crazy and incendiary things and that will get the viral. audience mm -hmm. and i get asked all the time by students i'll go speak to a college class and somebody will say i want to get into politics how do i how do i do it and i say why why do you want to get into politics what's your goal and they kind of look and i say cuz we don't need more people who think politics is cool they want to go into politics because they think it would be a neat thing to do or they want to be in front of the spotlight on TV. We need people who want to make change, who want to make a difference for their community and whatever that means to them, whatever issues are important. And you need to show that you have a commitment to your community rather than doing it for yourself. But the people who are in Washington today, I can absolutely say with certainty compared to 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, are much more inclined to run in front of the camp and politicians have always been that way. I'm not, right. you know, definitely to the 99th percentile of most Americans, but it's even much worse today. And it has an impact on public policy. I co-chair a board called the center for effective lawmaking, and it is jointly housed at university of Virginia and Vanderbilt university. And what they do is they look at the legislative effectiveness of members of Congress how effective are they at moving legislation? You introduce a bill, how far does it go through the process? And there's a ton of variables involved, including the significance of the bill and what committees you serve on and all the rest. But the point is, if every two years they release the list of every member of Congress, most effective to least effective. And what is uncanny about it is, if you look at the people who are the most effective members of Congress, I can promise you nobody has ever heard of them. They are names you do not see on TV. You don't read about them in the paper unless it's in your local district. No one around the country would know who these people are. But if you look at the bottom of the list, the people who can't get anything done, that their legislation doesn't move at all, I guarantee you, you will know every name, both on the right and the left. It's the people you see every night on Fox News or MSNBC or CNN pontificating about you know how they right. wish things were. But when they have the opportunity to move legislation, they don't do it because that's not what they're there for. They're there to get on TV. There is a direct relationship between how much of a media presence you have and how effective you are as a legislator. So, Jason, what I'm hearing from you is I don't know if you would have wanted to be in politics today compared to when you were in politics before. Well, I couldn't be. I, I wouldn't fit in. I wouldn't be happy. And candidly, I, I couldn't win today. I couldn't win a primary campaigning as a centrist. Uh, I was pretty lucky in retrospect that I caught the very tail end of when you could be viable uh, with that kind of candidate. I used to have as my tagline uh, for all my campaign speeches the first time I ran, I'm not going to be someone that walks on the floor and looks at my leadership and says, how do you want me to vote? That's not me. I'm going to look at the district. I'm going to look at the issue and I'm going to vote for what I think is right. And you can say that, but then what I found was I was a Democrat, but I'm sure the same applies on the other side. They don't really believe that. And when I yeah. implemented that methodology in the way I operated as a member of Congress, I got a lot of pushback from the Democrats because they said, well, that's not what we want. Well, today you couldn't get elected even with that type of mentality. You have to toe the party line. And if you in any way stray from party orthodoxy, you are going to face a primary. And as a first time candidate, you certainly could not vi viably run a campaign. Is that a concern that it's going to get far further left and further right? And the parties are going to be not for the people at all? I, it, yes, I, I would say I, I hate to be pessimistic. Uh, there are some who for whom that is not a pessimistic statement. You know, there are people who root for that outcome. But uh, I view that as a negative outcome. And I do feel like we we're heading we, we keep you when you think it can't get any worse with regard to polarization, it continues to get worse. It will because but I also think it's good. They it would be interesting to talk to Murdoch, talk to whoever owns these big. They love it. This is exactly what they want. You know, Newsmax now how it's grown extremely large based on polarization uh, and the, just different places. Uh I and then the sponsors love it because look at what uh you know doing a Twitter live interviewing Vladimir Putin and how much money is probably made off of that that it's changed 
absolutely changed. You know, I, so, I would like to see a study on the people who have made their career in the media since President Trump came onto the scene as a political candidate. He was obviously famous before politics, but from 2015, 2016 on, because if you are a Republican in particular who is willing to say something negative about President Trump, they will put you on TV. You have a full-time gig. And what was interesting is after he lost and he kind of, for a little while, faded away and wasn't in the news quite as much, right. all those people, they weren't asked on the shows anymore. But now you're starting to see them come out again because of the way the campaign has played out. But uh, more people made their careers off of talking about Donald Trump, I bet you, than anyone in American history uh, has driven Max, that push the of the social, the social media. And yeah, is look at me talking algorithms with you before we got on. Right. And, 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 you know, social media is not the easiest thing in the world. And it's really game. Now it's not your number of followers anymore. This is another dangerous part. And this is a, uh, I'll, I'll credit this to Neil Patel and Eric Sue, a marketing school podcast are really well-known digital marketers. They flat out said, it doesn't matter. We have really uh, made it so that it doesn't matter how many followers you have in social media anymore. It's all about the content you've created and how many people are engaged on it. And your, your, your last post is what's considered your post. So people can come out of nowhere, talk about specific things. And I think these politicians see that now. Oh my gosh, if I go and get a great camera work and say something crazy, I wouldn't have grew that, that kind of audience, but now I will. Yeah, Wait. and the ability to find like-minded compatriots did not exist before. So I always use this as an example. The guy who used to sit in his mother's basement yelling back at the TV because he was angry had nowhere else to go. He was completely alone and isolated. Now he can get on any social media and find people that feel and are just as angry as he is. And then they organize and they talk to each other and they get each other angry. Right. And and as you said, there there's hundreds or thousands of you know, people that are tweeting back at each other about the same right. thing when they used to just be alone in the basement yelling at the TV. Exactly. And look at Elon Musk, who's loud free speech, and that would be a question to finish up our interview. What are your thoughts? You know, now I'm allowing Twitter and X, Twitter slash X to be the only real platform that's not set up for a party where there's no real, uh, what is your thought of free speech on social media? How should that be handled and how have other platforms not allowed certain things that Republicans say, if you're against the vax, you could literally, ha even if you had a guest on and you were doing it and you put it on is misinformation at that time when it's come out, it's not all misinformation. What are your thoughts of the censoring of social media and media in general? I, I think there is a role for what you described to be censorship for things that have a, a chance of violence or, or, you know, hurtful speech. I mean, I, I do think there's a role to kind of tone it down on, on things that could degenerate into something really bad happening. But with that exception, you know, it's the public square and and people have a right to be wrong. They have a right to say whatever it is they want to say. And, uh, you know, you see it, 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 sports, politics, and religion are the three things that drive people crazy the most. And they say idiotic things because, you know, they, they have with religion, I shouldn't say idiot. I didn't mean that with religion, but the, the real beliefs, but they say yeah. things that are out of the mainstream to most people. And I, I think there's a, that's fine. Right. I mean, there's a role for that, but right. if you are passing along information that has a negative impact in a way that it could hurt people, like physically hurt people or turn into violence, then, you know, I, I think there's a role to force them to tone it down. Well, I've made a decision as a media company that I'm going to have both the left and right. I've never said no to anyone, but I've been afraid at times to post it everywhere. At this point, I'm saying I'm a journalist. I take both sides. I can't take a side because I want to be friends with everybody. I want to have a, and that's the center and really have relationships with both sides and relationships. Linda McMahon's going to be on my show in a couple of weeks to talk about her think tank. It'll be interesting to hear her. And then a couple other people that were in the Trump administration at that time, but ultimately opening up the door for other 
uh, Democrats to come on the show as well. I've had lots of actors and actresses that have been able to give their speech uh, for the Democratic Party. But hey, everyone's open to come on the Neil Haley show. Best place we can find information on you. Where can we go, Jason? I have a website. It is my name, jasonaltmeyer.com. If you Google it, I'm sure it comes up. And uh, really interested still in, in polarization. I speak about it all the time. So anyone who's interested in comparing notes, uh, you could reach me through there. And I'm happy to chat with anybody about it. All right. Thanks again, Jason, for stopping by. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. You're listening and watching The Neil Haley Show. And we'll be back in just a moment.